it's over it's over uh not only is it over 0.7 it's over one and so what's going on here which one's more realistic you know I, i'm confident it's the serum biomarkers that are comp that are more accurate and um and the reason rationale behind this is that well one is just natural history he's not old enough to likely have um cirrhosis which is what the apri is estimating and um more importantly, remember when, you, when, when you're basing a measurement on only two variables, like the APRI is just looking at his transaminases and platelet count, it can be um, falsely elevated or falsely, um, I'd just say it, it can be more misleading because you're only looking at two data points. Whereas the serum biomarkers look at a bunch of different biosynthetic products of the liver as well as breakdown products. Um, and so I, I, I don't think in this guy, he needs long-term HCC screening. Whereas, you know, if we if we um, gave the APRI score, it's due, we would say, my gosh, there's significant fibrosis. And even after treatment, this guy would need long-term right upper quadrant ultrasounds from now and forever. And uh, I do not believe that that's at all worth it. I think that the APRI is uh, reflecting simply his impressive transaminitis. And, uh, you know, one of the things you can recalculate is after, after you cure his hep C and it'll be normal because he's got normal plate of count and his transaminases will come down to normal after his treatment and so on and so forth. So anyway, it's just a cool, cool case from that perspective. I agree hundred percent with you on the treatment modality. I'm a big fan of shorter is better. Um, and genotype one, a is the sky's the limits with regard to our commonly used medicines. So Harvoni, Epclusa. And uh, Maverite are all options. Remember, um, if we did go Harvoni, he could be short course because he's less than six million on his viral load. And I, I always mention this one: um, depending upon the age of the resource you look at, uh, being African American might exclude you from getting a short course of Harvoni of eight weeks, one pill a day. But the more recent recommendations do not suggest that that's uh, something we need to consider as a variable. So he could be eight weeks of Harvoni, eight weeks of Maverite, or um, 12 weeks of Epclusa. And, uh, and then just for our own comfort, when he's cured, go ahead and recalculate that APRI to prove he won't need anything long-term. Great job and sad story, but hopefully with a happy ending. Thank you so much, Dr. Gilfus. Robin, did you want to move to the next case? I'm having a hard time seeing which. Um, oh no, I'll sh I'll share the screen. You're fine. I was just asking to make sure you're okay. 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 So this patient, um, he's 33 years old. Um, she was diagnosed a couple of years ago. Uh, at, well, several years ago at Wealth Community Hospital during an ER visit for, I can't, I don't recall the reason. Um, she is, you know, I'm going to go down through her medication list. She's on several um, psych meds, but I don't think she's on any psych or any meds that will interact with her treatment. Um, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time getting the control. Okay, um, so I do have her on vitamin D replacement. She is on Suboxone and um, she seems to be doing well with her recovery right now. Um, she is working now and so I feel like she's got a decent support system. So I feel like she's going to do well with her treatment. As far as her labs, um, her kidney function is good. Her platelets are 375. Liver enzymes are well within the normal range. Um, her APRI score is 0.120. Um, male score of six, and she's also class A with her child trophies class classification. Um, at 1A, I think another, uh, yeah, the best treatment option for her too would be also the Maverick for eight weeks.
I think that's all I really need to say on that one. Great, thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions about this case? Okay, now the recommendations. Sorry, I tried not to mute myself. Uh, and I agree with you, Robin. There's, I don't find anything complicating in her case um, at all. Uh, pretty clear cut. Um, too young to really have any significant damage. I don't see any extra hepatic manifestations on there that um, we'll really have to follow long term. And, and I agree with you. The eyeball test on her medications look fine. Um, and uh, so really the options are up to her as a patient and her provider as to which drug you want to give. And uh, I, I agree with you, Maverick 8 or um, Epclusa for, uh, for 12 or Harvoni for for eight, I don't know. I think we have a rational drug on here. Do you guys cover met Harvoni for eight weeks um, in these scenarios where it's we're, 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 we're. Oh, darn it. I think we have rational drug, but I can't hear them. Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll do some charades action. Yeah, so, yeah, charades is good. Or if you want to just chat that in, um, Angie, that'd be fine too. Or if Rachel um, has that answer. The coverage for eight weeks of Harvoni for Medicaid. Is that what you're asking? Sorry, I, I literally just jumped on. <laughs> yes, yes, I'm okay. sorry, Rachel. Yeah, it was, um, there's two cases in a row that have been actually fairly low viral loads and um. Uh, without any real medical contra or I should say medication interaction contraindications for Harvoni. Um, and uh, I know it's not one we talk about that often, um, but, but still is a valid option, um, at least from a conceptual standpoint. And uh, I know ultimately it comes down to payer preference. And do, have you had familiarity with Medicaid and the, and, and the short course Harvoni? Sure. So they are not uh, currently covering Harvoni for the eight week treatment, unless there is some compelling reason not to use one of the preferred agents, um, which would be the Epclusa for 12 or the Maverick for eight. Yeah. And, th and there would not be a medically compelling reason here or in the first case, um, just simply giving full representation to all options. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate sure it. And Robin, I agree with your judgment. This is another one and done treater be done and all is well in the world. It's a uh, nice to nice to get that behind her. She's of childbearing age. So, um, and, and I didn't look at her med list in detail to see if you have any um, contraceptive, contraceptive. I'm sorry, she's not on birth control right now. And I tried to call her this morning, um, but I didn't get her. So I'll touch base with her again about birth control options before we get her treatment started. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, and that's, uh, and Rachel can speak to that as well. The Maverick will have some issues with uh, some of the birth control agents, but it's really, I, my recollection is the estrogen containing ones, not progesterone. That's correct. So the, that drug interaction there is with the ethanol estradiol specifically, which is found in most of the combined hormonal contraceptives. Um, so anything that is progestin only. So the, the mini pill, of course, um, even if it's a drug eluding uh, IUD, those are progestin only. And then the long acting. So the depot, the IM injection, as well as the um, Nexplanon uh, implant. Um, the rod, those are all progestin only. So those are all good options from a birth control standpoint that you could use for patients if you were leaning towards Maverick. Um, Cause most of those combined hormonal ones, the, the estrogen component is gonna be that ethanol estradiol, even if it's the vaginal ring, which I know is sometimes misleading cause you think it's more topical, but the interaction is, is still a concern there. Um, there is some systemic involvement. So the, and that interaction, we don't really know specifically what it is or what the, you know, what that, um, what the, the major, reason for it, but the studies when they originally were, were looking at Maverick as well as the older drug we don't use as much by Kira, um, 
the, uh, they saw the patients that were taking ethanoestradiol and these medications had an elevation of their ALT specifically. Uh, as, as soon as they stopped the drugs, um, that corrected. So don't know exactly why, but that's our, our concern is, is that interaction, which is why they're not recommended to be given together. Thanks, Rachel. I always do that so much more better than my bumbling through memory. And, um, and then uh, the, I guess always the other option is abstinence for the eight weeks, you know, ensure no procreation um, as opposed to pharmacologic insurance of that, assurance of that. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your guys' recommendations. And Robin, thank you again for your cases. We'll do the last two cases now. We'll just move on to case 2380. So I'll share my screen for you. Okay, so this patient is a little bit more complicated um, than the other ones, but for various reasons. She actually, she's 41 years old now. Um, she and her significant other, her boyfriend, both are in the process of getting treatment or trying to get treatment. There were some insurance issues that were working out, which is something else I'll bring up at the end of this presentation. But um, she has a history of IV drug use since uh, 2002. She was diagnosed at 2003 um, with, at an ER visit with hepatitis. Um, she's used meth, cocaine, opioids, tattoos. She has been clean for a, a long time now, I think several years. Um, in addition to the comorbidities that are listed on her screen, she also has MTHFR and schizophrenia. Um, the MTHFR, that's why she's on the clopida grill. Um, and the schizophrenia, she does the psych for that. Now, um, there has been some, some change since this medication list was posted. She is no longer on the Keppra. She is actually on trileptal and lamictal. So I feel like, I know I'm probably gonna to have to stop the trileptal because I think that that will cause her to have failure of treatment. Um, and I sent her to a neurologist. The neurologist actually wants her to see a, a seizure clinic, which we're in the process of getting scheduled. So I'm not sure he's gonna change any medicines. So I think I'm going to take her off of the trileptal and put her on um, maybe either pregabalin or um, maybe something else. I think she can have Keppra or pregabalin rather than, I'm sorry, she's on the oxy trileptal now. I'm going to put her on Keppra or pregabalin and leave her on lamictal, I think, if that's appropriate. Um, as far as her lab work, she has relatively um, normal EBC. Her AST and her ALT are also within normal range. Her APRI score is 0.234 and her child turco Q is class A as well. A male score of six. Um, she is genotype 1A, and since she is treatment naive also, I think Maverick for eight weeks for her, um, or Epclusive for 12, but, you know, the first thing I'm going to have to do is try to clean her, her seizure medicine, or I guess before we start, she doesn't need birth control because she's had a tubal ligation and an ablation, but she does uh, she's not sexually active anyway, even though she's got a boyfriend. So, so I think that's all for her. So, oh no, it's not actually. Now, my one issue with her actually is I just talked to her this morning, and she recently changed her insurance. We live on the border of Virginia and West Virginia here, and so she moved over to Virginia. And so through this process, she was West Virginia Medicaid, and now she's Virginia Medicaid as of this week. So is that gonna change this whole process? Do I have to start over? Or is, is that gonna just, I don't know what to do about this. Thank you so much. Um, that is very good questions and complicated. Does anybody have any other clarifying questions before we go into the discussion and recommendation portion? 
and then Angie chatted in, it will be whichever um, insurance she has when the prescription is billed. Will that be Virginia's Medicaid? I mean, are you asking me? It, yeah. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> it's to Virginia Medicaid. And so I guess, you know, I've not been dealing with the insurance part of this. So I'm not sure if that's, since this is a West Virginia program, is that going to change my treatment, you know, this process with her? Or since she's, you know, my patient and I'm in West Virginia, can we still proceed with treatment through Virginia Medicaid? So from an authorization standpoint, from, from my perspective, this is Rachel, the, um, the, what I do not know the answer to is whether or not Virginia Medicaid would accept a consultation via West Virginia's ECHO program. So we do usually, um, you know, West Virginia Medicaid and some of the other insurers, they do accept that from, from our providers here, but I am not familiar enough with Virginia to know the answer to that question. I, I can read something from their website if that's okay, but you're going to have to define it, what this means. Um, so it says that the Medicaid, it, it basically in Virginia, it says that they do not impose prescriber restrictions for preferred medicines on their list. So if they have preferred medicines on their Medicaid access, um, they don't have the same prescriber restrictions um, as we do here in West Virginia. So there's this, there's this, um, website called stateofhepc.org and you can go to whatever state you're interested in and it grades them uh, by, uh, by um, well, basically sobriety restrictions, prescriber restrictions, fibrosis restrictions, all that stuff. West Virginia is currently a C plus, which is surprising because honestly, I think we're, I think we're pretty good now with the exception of, um, a, you know, a, a little bit of uh, sobriety concerns. Um, we don't have a lot of restrictions going on, but anyway, uh, Virginia is rated as an A, an A. And uh, at least from uh, reading in this scenario, Virginia, similarly to here, does not impose liver fibrosis restrictions. Um, they do not have any sobriety restrictions, nor do they have prescriber restrictions for preferred drugs. So the only thing is, is what are their preferred drugs and uh, at least if I'm reading this correctly, you should be good to go from that perspective. Hope that's helpful. And Rachel, can you can you help me out with the drug interaction? I tried to run her stuff through our computer, and I'm getting confusing results. So if uh, I know you know the seizure med stuff well. Sure thing. Yeah, I, and I, I was trying to keep track here, um, making some quick notes. I'm also trying to navigate the Westford, or I'm sorry, the Virginia Medicaid site here. So I apologize. I'm doing both places, but if I understand correctly, you are going to leave the lamictal, mm -hmm. stop the trileptal, and then potential to change her to pregabalin or Keppra. Did yeah. I write that down correctly? Okay. So the that sounds like a good plan as far as treatment goes, because the trileptal is going to be your, your hiccup there. That's just like you said, it's going to lead to potential for treatment failure because it's going to make her, you know, subtherapeutic potentially for with the all of the um, DAAs. So it doesn't matter which therapy you choose, they're all contraindicated with that trileptal. So uh, I think that's a good plan because you don't really have the, um, with any of the, any of the agents. So I don't know Virginia's Medicaid's formulary, but any of them are are generally safe with the pregabalin, the Keppra and the Lamictal. Um, we don't see the interactions there that we see with the trileptal. The only other thing to be cautious about is I see the pantoprazole on here, the protonics. Um, so that PPI is um, gonna have issues with the um, Epclusa and the Harvoni as far as the acid suppression and, and decreasing those levels. So um, that would be, you know, that's something that you could easily work around by, you know, doing the omeprazole 20, um, or if she's okay to stop it, you got some easier ways to work around that than the trileptal. But if you're stopping that, I think everything else here from a drug interaction standpoint, um, for most of the agents is gonna be just fine. I don't have any other major concerns for interactions or, or failure of therapy or anything like that. Thank you. And Brian, I see that you have a muted. Did you want to chime in at all? Yeah, you can do an introduction too of yourself if you'd like. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I was going to comment about John's uh, uh, comment about the grade. I, I, um, 
Well, for those of you who might not know who I am, I'm the pharmacy director for West Virginia Medicaid. And uh, anyway, uh, I've been um, considering uh, removing the sobriety restrictions, John. Um, I can't handle C plus, so yeah. No. Uh, we may be making, I'm actually working on some of the, on doing an update to the criteria to significantly shorten it, as well as to update uh, the algorithm because it's pretty complicated now and the recommendations are much more consolidated. Uh, so uh, maybe keep an eye on that in the next couple of weeks, we may have uh, an update on that. So we'll have to vote on removal of the sobriety requirements if we go that direction though. So the next UR board is February 16th. Brian, uh, thanks for explaining that. And I don't think you guys get a C plus. Honestly, I don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, you know, we've, we've been happy. Dr. Feinberg and I have been very pleased. So thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you. It's it's all in comparison. You know, we didn't change any criteria and we go from, I think we were like an A minus or a B or something at one point and then it goes down. So it's all in, it's all a comparison. But, um, you know, I've just been debating it. it it's It's so hard because... You know, Dr. Becker treats a lot of these patients and and he says he has a lot of patients that he just doesn't feel they're ready. And, um, you know, I respect providers making that call until I see some crazy responses, uh, crazy appeals where they want really weird uh, 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 regimens or you have a patient that's been um, treated almost three times, you know, because they threw out their medication. They, you know, so you see this, this stuff and uh, knowing how big of a battle we went through to get the fibrosis scores removed, because uh, that was not what the legislator, legislature wanted us to do. And, and really, um, you know, the commissioner was worried that she would get in trouble for uh, if this budget blew up. I, I'm just concerned about doing anything that might reverse our gains there. But I, I do think it's probably the right thing to do uh, to put more of the choice in the provider's hands. Um, and, uh, you know, we're already seeing some retreatments regardless whether we have that sobriety requirement, which is really just an attestation anyway. Um, so it really comes down to the judgment of the prescriber. And that's why I'm really trying to engage with ECHO and West Virginia Ham to make sure that we have quality judgments being made. So anyway. And that's a beautiful statement. And I agree with you. A lot of times, honestly, our, um, what prevents us from writing the prescription is the conversation we have with the patient more than anything else, that, rather than that attestation. So uh, you're, you're hit the nail on the head. I, Thank I you. Agree with you. Uh, and last thing I was gonna say, we are, let me turn on my tool real quick. I may need a raise in here. Um, we are using our retrospective DUR program, which, uh, you know, some doctors I'm sure hate and some, you know, maybe appreciate it, but it's a requirement that we, we do these uh, retrospective reviews of diagnoses and drugs and see if we, you know, prospective DUR for anybody who doesn't know it is are the edits that your member, your patient has to go through to get their medication from the pharmacy. Retrospective on the other hand happens after they've already picked up their medication uh, because the diagnoses aren't real time. So we still have to look and make sure that somebody's whole, uh, pharmacy regimen and their disease states don't cause some sort of concern about dosing. Sometimes you see a disease state that uh, it makes it advisable to lower a dose of a medication or to not even use a medication. So we have to run that program. One of the things that we do, we're doing right now is looking at patients that have a diagnosis of hepatitis C, but have never had a, a drug claim for one of the newer agents. And so we're reaching out to those, those providers just to we're going to be sending out a survey as well to see what are the reasons for not treating the patient. Um, you know, was it that you you saw the criteria a few years ago, didn't think they met it, never looked back at it? Are they not ready for treatment? Um, you know, are you not? Uh, we have you. Uh, you know, we we're trying to identify who the current doctor is, so maybe they're not the current doctor. I'm contacting the wrong person. So. If you see something like that, that's what that's about. We're trying to we're trying to also uh, encourage people to uh, to get treatment. Thank you so much. And go ahead, Doctor Gilfus. I saw you unmuted. Robin, I was going to ask, do you have any insight? Uh, sort of kick it off what what Brian just mentioned. Do you have any insight why it took this lady twenty years to seek treatment? Because uh, she's known about it for a long time. Uh, it's it is always fun to assay that. 
in patients to see what the obstacles are? I think a lot of what is happening with the population I take care of is they, it is, it has become such a norm that patients don't realize that it's a big deal. And so when she got diagnosed, she kind of put it on the back burner, didn't worry about it. She wasn't experiencing any side effects, any symptoms. And so I think they just forget about it. And then when I saw her boyfriend, he is actually the one that convinced her to come in for treatment. I actually told him to call her and get her to come let me check her and, you know, see what we could do for her. And so then she decided she wanted treatment. So I just really think that they don't understand what hepatitis C can do to them. And so they just don't seek out treatment. Appreciate you sharing that. Yeah, I agree with you. Thank you so much. And then Rachel also chatted, looks like um, Virginia Medicaid preferred HCV DAAs are Maverick and generic Acusa. So same as West Virginia Medicaid. Um, so with that, Dr. G said, if you're using a non-preferred agent like Harvoni or Zepatar, they do want a specialist, but if you're using their preferred, no requirement for specialist prescribed, and she included a link, and we'll have that in the recommendations for you, Robin, as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. We'll just have one more case, and just give me a moment. <laughs> and this is 2520. Okay, so this patient is 29-year-old female. Um, she has been clean um, for, since August the 3rd. She... Um, I, I really don't know how long she's had it. I don't think, I think it was two to three years ago that she got diagnosed with this. So she's not had it for that long. Um, she was in a Southern Highlands long-term rehab program. Now she's graduated to uh, a home where she has a little bit more freedom. She is working. So she's doing well with her, um, with her sobriety and she um, is a good candidate, I think, for treatment. Um, she is just on some basic medications. She's on a fluid pill, she's on ibuprofen, and she's, um, she has hypertension, which I think is controlled right now on her current medicine. Um, she is immune to hepatitis A. Um, how, her hepatitis B, she is also immune to that. Her core was positive, so luckily for her, she develops immunity after exposure. Um, looks like her CDC was kind of unremarkable, ASP and ALP, um, a little elevated. Um, she's also genotype 1A. Um, her viral load, actually the one that's reported on this sheet is 38,000. I rechecked it and it's 26,000. So it's, you know, hanging around the, around the same thing. She's a class a on her child turco Q in a mild score of six with her. Her APRI was 0.336. Um, I don't think I, I already said she's type 1A. Well, so I think she also would be um, a candidate for the Maverick for eight weeks. Maverick for everybody. <laughs> You get Maverick, you get Maverick. <laughs> Any other questions um, with this case so for good recommendations? Hey, it's John. Um, Robin, just impressed with the volume that you deal with and, and, and the ages, these are all young people. And uh, as such, it's uh, what a great time to treat them before you run into long-term trouble. You know, the only shocking thing about her case is she's in her, um, you know, 20s and on two antihypertensives. And as we, as we sort of big picture hepatitis C, uh, remember some of the extra hepatic risks um, are not just uh, related to um, the, I should say some of the risks are, are not just related to liver, but some are extra hepatic, including the chronic inflammation from hep C exacerbating cardiovascular risk. So as you start quantitating this lady's risk factors, you know, uh, you might be helping her 15 years down the road, uh, avoid, uh, uh, you know, a premature MI or some other cardiovascular morbidity. So extra impetus to get these patients treated. So uh, good stuff. And, and of course, uh, she has no fibrosis. She's got nothing to worry about. So she should be a cure and done with either your Maverick or Epclusa, um, as you mentioned. So good choices. And very proud of you for assessing that hepatitis B core 
as nothing to worry about. You're right on. As long as you developed good ample antibodies to the surface antigen, so got, as long as you've got good surface antibody, um, this is a, a patient that's considered a, a good natural uh, control of, um, of the hep B and, and, and not the ones that we worry about reactivation. And so good job, good assessment of that one. And uh, yeah, let's get her treated and uh, see what happens. Now, unlike diabetes, with diabetes, you can actually so, see some improvement in um, their, their uh, glycemic control after treating hep C. I, I don't know of any data that says that you will see you know, less hypertension or anything like that. It just is uh, that you know, by eliminating the chronic inflammatory state, you're gonna be removing one of her cardiovascular risk factors long-term. And then, uh, you know, we're always picky on the vitamin D. Gosh, I, I think everybody feels better with a vitamin D of 40. So maybe, you know, get her on a low dose vitamin D, a thousand or 2000 a day for a while and see what happens. But great job. Good stuff. And keep sending these young patients. That's. I have a question. Um, this is not related to these four cases, but this is a general question. I'm like, I guess you all can tell I've got a gob of patients that I see here for this. I have a couple of patients with a viral load. For example, I have one that his viral load was 420. Okay, so it with that, I mean, should I repeat that in three months? Is he a candidate for treatment at a viral load of 420? Yeah, or, it's a great question. You know, um, and, and we got Brian on here. He can even address like the the the, the issue that so recently, you know, Medicaid has eliminated this um, need to check two viral loads. Um, but the, the, my real answer for you is uh, is twofold. As always, I'm verbose, so I, I won't give you a straightforward answer. I'm gonna give you a long-winded answer, but hopefully an honest one. Um, so stepping back first, um, viral load does not tell us as much with hepatitis C as it does with HIV. And with HIV, you know, the viral load is everything. Um, it tends to prognosticate progression of, of uh, you know, immune decline, et cetera. Um, but with hepatitis C, um, you can see um, low viral loads yet still have people progress to cirrhosis. So it, it is something that, or significant fibrosis. So um, it's less prognostic of whether or not they develop hepatic damage. Now, that being said, the kinetics matter a ton. Um, so if you had a marker on this lady that said that she was, um, you know, high, say she was 2 million uh, two months ago and is now 400. Yeah, I think I would just wait and see what happens. I would sit back and be like, oh my gosh, maybe she's one of these people that's going to clear. Remember the statistics on acute clearance, you know, that's before the six months are pretty impressive, you know, before, dur during the acute hepatitis C phase, even if you don't necessarily catch somebody with a symptomatic acute hepatitis, in other words, no jaundice appearance and liver enzymes in the thousands, but you're catching them early on. There, there's that, you know, depends 15 to 30% chance that they could clear. That's just natural history of the disease. Um, and, and some people I've seen, it's, it's measured in one hand, the number of people I've seen clear hep C on their own later than six months, but it happens. It absolutely can happen. So if you had a kinetic that said, oh my gosh, this is changing markedly in a very optimistic manner. Yeah, you could sit and watch and wait. Um, you know, the, uh, that being said, um, you know, Medicaid has removed the obstacles to immediate therapy. You could also just go ahead and pull the trigger. Um, but so it all matters what you want to do from that perspective. But remember that viral load is not as um, I, I'm not floridly tickled by a low viral load versus a high viral load. You know, it's not something that really I pay a ton of attention to. I almost treat it as, as digital. Yes, no, present, not present. Um, that being said, the kinetics in a scenario like that would matter. So sorry, that was a lot of words, but I hope it made sense. Yeah, you uh, pretty much summed up everything I was going to say exactly, uh, you know, obviously with more expertise behind it, but uh, I've always looked at the viral load as a yes, no sort of thing. And, and the reason why we had two uh, viral loads before was to, to take for something, a case exactly like this. But I also wanted to give flexibility to um, providers who might have encountered their, you know, their patient for the first time who has had a history of knowing they had hep C. So, you know, there was this desire that, no, I, this guy was diagnosed with hep C a while back. Why do I need to do two, two treatments? So we, we were trying to kind of throw a bone out there for, for providers. But yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with everything you said and you said it really well. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Dr. Gilfeis. 
No, no, I was just thanking Brian. And, and uh, yeah, I, I, our goal is not to treat these patients that are acute hep C. It's a, uh, yeah, we're not going to take advantage of this loophole, but I appreciate that, um, that ability for us to treat people who come into our care and have this historic record of, uh, you know, very remote diagnosis, but we just can't find it. So that, that's really, I think the purpose of the loophole is to treat those patients. So thanks, thanks very much. Wow. Great to have both of your input. And thank you so much, Rachel, too, for yours and Angie in the chat. Sorry, your mic's still not working. <laughs> All right, um, Dr. Gilfus, I have made you a co-host so you can continue from where you left off in your um, didactic. All right. Um, I think this is the embarrassing part is I don't remember what slide it was. It was, um, I think here, I do think it was just after we finished discussing how to do fibrosis assessment and stuff like that. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that this slide has not been sort of lost in all the details of the last um, talk, because this is perhaps, this is the most heartbreaking part of hepatitis C and it's, um, it's HCC development. Um, the, the cases that have made me most sad um, throughout the past 15 years of treating people with hepatitis C are the ones that I lose to care and um, they don't undergo appropriate HCC screening and then eventually develop cancer. Um, so remember untreated hepatitis C is a major risk factor for development of liver cancer, um, but it has to develop usually through, I should say always, exclusively through um, the development of fibrosis first. So it's really these patients that have advanced fibrosis, F3, F4, that um, we have to do ongoing screening for, even after successful treatment. So studies have definitely shown that once you cure the hepatitis, your likelihood of progression to hepatocellular cancer is less. But remember, it's really the scar tissue that is... Uh, carcinogenic more so than the virus itself. Now that's different than hep B. Hepatitis B has an actual oncogene in its uh, genome. So you can go along and go directly to cancer even without fibrosis with hepatitis B. But hepatitis C has this uh, requisite fibrosis first. So anyway, I, I, I do a lousy job with this um, and I'm trying to do a better job with it of discussing long-term HCC screening right up front. And so remember this talk was a continuation of our initial assessment of people with, with hepatitis C. And, and I think everybody knows the word cirrhosis and, and uh, patients are familiar with that concept, but, um, but at least introducing this concept that, hey, um, liver cancer uh, is, is something that we need to screen for long-term, at least in your patients who have uh, established fibrosis. Um, now this, this uh, other thing it says on here is we don't necessarily check alpha feed protein. And, and, I, and I follow those liver disease guidelines pretty well. The only scenarios um, where I hedge and go ahead and check an alpha feed protein on people is if the ultrasonographer or radiologist um, hedge on their read at all. If they at all give me any sense that their picture that they're taking is not perfect. Um, so, and that scenario comes up sometimes with really advanced fibrosis. So that's actually the highest risk patients. Sometimes they'll say, Hey, this liver is so dense. I can't really promise you that there's not some little something hiding in there. So in those scenarios, a lot of times the radiologist will suggest an MRI. Um, and, and, uh, and I'll also supplement, um, the liver cancer screening with an alpha feed protein in those scenarios. So incredibly, so I, yeah, can tell you some sad stories about people who, um, you know, we've treated their hep C, they've been cured, they've gone about their life and then uh, had HCC um, strike them down years later. And it's almost always uh, people who didn't have good um, follow-up. And uh, so let's make sure we emphasize that up front for patients. All right, that's probably the most important slide. So everybody else can daydream the rest. The rest is stuff you all know. So what are the um, factors that tend to impact progression of HCV. And we can, we can talk to patients about this or just be aware of it on our first visit with them. So obviously look for co-infections with things that um, can either immunosuppress you or cause ongoing liver damage, such as hepatitis B or HIV. Uh, we wanna advise our patients not to drink. Um, and be aware that the older they age, the more likely they are to have 
fibrosis present and progressed to more fibrosis. Remember other hits on the liver, especially the metabolic milieu with fatty liver, obesity, diabetes, et cetera. Um, we, we stress on this vitamin D deficiency. And again, it's been most well proven for vitamin, I'm sorry, for uh, hepatitis B, but we sort of do an extension of logic into the other chronic hepatitis, um, which is hep C. And then uh, be aware if your patient is immunosuppressed. And I'm, I'm blown away by how many patients nowadays are immunosuppressed, uh, either from a rheumatologic standpoint or um, uh, oncologic standpoint or, 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 or something. Uh, you know, we see a lot of patients who are on something that suppresses their endogenous uh, cell mediated immunity. And uh, so be aware that those patients can progress more rapidly. And of course, the one viral factor specifically from FC is genotype three that tend to move more quickly towards uh, scar tissue. So, um, and then vaccinations. So the, uh, these are really, the first two are logical. So of course, if you have a patient with um, hepatitis C, you wanna make sure hepatitis A vaccination should be, if, if you ask me what's the single most important vaccine to give a patient with hep C, it's the hep A vaccine. And, and the rationale behind that is, you know, hepatitis A is the is not as as avoidable as hep B. You know, if we're doing our job as as providers and we're assessing our patients um, and and considering them for hepatitis C treatment, we hope they're not having ongoing risk for acquisition of hep B. You know, we're we're hoping that they're not having ongoing parenteral drug use or high risk sexual encounters or something that could put them at high risk for reacquisition of hep C. So, you know, the hep B vaccination is something we do. It makes sense. It's logical. But the hep A, everyone's at risk for hep A. You know, I don't know anybody who's really uh, potentially not because you could go out and eat at the wrong restaurant at the wrong time and get hepatitis A. So, and uh, while it's a lousy month of uh, GI perturbation, if you don't have hep C, if you actually have co-infection with hep A and hep C, it can be fatal. So there's literally, in the, in the most recent hepatitis A outbreaks and California and West Virginia, Kentucky, and now Virginia, you know, there's a measurable mortality to hepatitis A in the setting of hep C co-infections. So vaccinate, 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 hep A vaccine, most important one up there. And I mentioned that B. And then the ones that are kind of funny is all this stuff related to um, respiratory disease. So pneumococcal vaccine, flu vaccine, COVID vaccine. So, um, you know, it turns out the liver is a very immunologically important organ. And uh, if your liver is not working well, if its biosynthetic function is really uh, not ideal, you're gonna not make as much of your innate immune proteins and uh, can suffer from increased morbidity um, from uh, common respiratory infections. COVID, pneumovax, and flu shot should be there. All right. Um, and yeah, assess your patients for extrahepatic manifestations. One of the things I'm always doing when you guys are presenting these cases is trying to see if there are any extrahepatic manifestations or symptoms. And this is, you know, this can be patient motivating for one, you know, if we're assessing our patient for the first time and, and they think they don't have any symptoms, but, um, maybe they've just been thinking that their, uh, myalgias and arthralgias and low energy are just part of aging or part of withdrawal process or part of X, Y, or Z. Um, we can sometimes, you know, encourage them that, hey, you know, you, you might genuinely feel better. Maybe this hepatitis C is not as asymptomatic as we, uh, or you, as you thought. So, uh, and of course, there's, there's bona fide extrahepatic manifestations of hep C. Uh, and those are myriad. I think we have, we have an entire didactic on it um, that I think I did in August or something. But remember, these can be um, everything from as common as diabetes exacerbation, um, to really exotic things like lymphoma and uh, cryoglobulinemia. So a lot of these are a consequence of chronic immune activation. Uh, and some of them are a consequence of direct viral um, activity at an organ other than the liver, such as diabetes and so on and so forth. And remember, virtually any autoimmune disorder can be an extra hepatic manifestation of hep C. So um, that's one I always hit PubMed. If it's one I don't know off the top of my head, but somebody carries a particularly odd autoimmune disease, see if there is an association between that and hepatitis C. Again, the relationship is that chronic immune activation and uh, inadvertent development of autoantibodies. So we want to check for these when we're seeing our patients. And of course, hopefully we would not find this on our initial assessment. We, we, we don't want to find um, that your patient on your initial assessment has signs or symptoms of chronic liver disease. On occasion, it's, it's uh, 
you, you're diagnosing their hep C at the same time as you're diagnosing their cirrhosis. That's an unfortunate day. Um, and if it does happen, uh, what you'd be looking for is, uh, you know, evidence of ascites, peripheral edema, um, you know, a history of recent variceal bleeding um, or, you know, memory that's not quite up to par. Um, and uh, screening your patients for that if you think they've had advanced liver disease. Obviously, the patients Robin presented today were all in their 30s. You know, this isn't people that we think would have cirrhosis, but if it was a baby boomer and somebody getting up there in age and you want to make sure you do good uh, history to make sure they don't have any um, history of uh, things that would signify chronic liver disease or advanced liver disease. And if they did, you know, introduce the concept of, hey, you know, even this is all said and done, we have to manage your cirrhosis long term. We'll have to do those HCC screenings and, uh, you know, worst come to worst, transplants always on the table, but hopefully we'll never have to go there. Um, and of course, advising our patients about alcohol and other herbal supplements. Rachel does a beautiful job talking about the herbal supplementations and over-the-counter supplementations. And basically our advice should be, um, you know, taking X, Y, or Z supplement to help your liver. Uh, I, I don't know what they're going to do. Let's just actually treat you with something we know is going to help your liver. That's the Mavrita, Pusa, Harvoni, et cetera. Um, cause there are drug interactions with herbal whatnot. And, uh, I, I, really encourage people to not try any homeopathic or over-the-counter or um, herbal remedies uh, and let us take a swing at it with the actual FDA approved regimens that will treat their liver troubles. Um, and uh, you know, the issue with a lot of people come in with a history of liver disease and tell me, oh, I can't, or at least a history of hepatitis. And I say, oh, I can't take Tylenol. And, and you know, that's not really true. Or they say, I can't take NSAIDs. It's not really true. The, the issue is in chronic liver disease, we should probably be cautious that we aren't going to give something that's going to exacerbate the likelihood of GI bleeding. Uh, remember, these cirrhotic patients not only have varices, they have portal gastropathy, and they also often have low platelets. So that's the patient you'd like to avoid NSAIDs in. Um, and then also you want to avoid overdosing on a Tylenol. That's a good advice all the time, um, but you really just want to tell them to keep their Tylenol use um, well below the uh, maximum therapeutic allowance per day. <clears throat> but an occasional Tylenol as needed for a headache or minor aches and pains is fine. And then we talked about this one too, that man, all these cases today were super pertinent because uh, uh, re remember the issues with pregnancy and hepatitis C, it's always been this big area of concern. Um, yes, we, we, we um, do see vertical transmission. It's not common, but we can tell patients today, um, you know, you might want to treat your hepatitis C uh, if you're contemplating childbirth because there is, there is a small but real chance of uh, transmission of mother child. Sadly, we don't have any means of decreasing that while you're pregnant, but if you could preemptively treat somebody, you could uh, um, cure them before they would have any risk of that 6% transmission rate. Um, the, the whole issue with prohibition of um, getting pregnant in hepatitis C really um, is a holdover from the ribavirin days. Ribavirin is an impressive teratogen. Um, both men and women who used to take that medication had to avoid childbearing for a, a long time. Uh, you definitely didn't want to be pregnant and take the medicine, and you didn't even want to get pregnant six months or, 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 uh, or, or, or uh, father a child either for six months afterwards. But uh, the current medications are gonna undergo trials. Dr. Feinberg um, is really aware of these trials more than myself, um, but there's, there's gonna be trials. And I bet you in the future, our pregnant patients will hopefully represent a very captive audience who will be um, safe to describe, uh, I'm sorry, prescribe DAAs to, but right now we don't have the data to support it. So we basically tell people not to get pregnant. And Rachel already touched on the drug-drug interactions between them. Um, the estradiols and the PIs, the proteus inhibitor containing regimens. The last little thing down here is something I never remember and I always forget to emphasize, um, but uh, breastfeeding is, um, is okay uh, if, if you have hepatitis C and it's untreated. So it's, it's kind of interesting. So hep for HIV, we tell moms not to breastfeed, but apparently for HCV, you can't. Now, if for any reason you were breastfeeding and on HCV treatment, now I'm doing the math there. I don't know how that would happen. That'd be, that'd be unlikely, but uh, in that scenario, um, we don't have data on it, so we'll avoid it. And then planning for treatment. We just want to introduce these treatment concepts. And the major thing about treatment concepts is kind of bragging about how easy it is and how good the treatments are. We kind of talk about, hey, these are, you're taking a, treatments for two to three months and you're, uh, 
rate of cure is 99%, you might feel better, you might feel great. And uh, we have very few restrictions that should prevent you from being treated. Um, make sure you do discuss what adherence challenges. I know you guys are all expert at that. You um, uh, better at that than I am, uh, making sure that your patients are not gonna run into any logistical hurdles um, while, uh, while trying to recall to take their medications for two to three months. And then of course, looking for drug drug interactions, assess their financial challenges, um, you know, that's part of what you all are doing here on the ECHO program is making sure that the prescriber restrictions are overcome. And, uh, and of course, remember drug and alcohol counseling. Uh, that should be first and last in any uh, discussion on a patient with hepatitis C, just making sure that they uh, have ample support for their substance abuse history, if that's part of their history. Because remember, like I mentioned during last talk, that's what kills people is relapse to drug and alcohol. And I think that's it. I got to finish it up. Questions from anyone? That was a great job. Thank you so much. You did perfect timing. <laughs> Couldn't align to better. Um, a little fast. I wanted to get bit finished. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you guys so much. Um, we're going to close it. If you have any questions, please go ahead, Brian. I see you on mute if you want to say anything. I was just going to say bye. And it was oh, nice. <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, everyone. And thank you again, Robin, for the cases. You guys are so good at that. Um, our next one is February 10th. And Angela Wojcik is going to be discussing CDC updates on PrEP. So thanks again and have a great week. And Bye -bye. John, really good job. Too. This was very interesting to me. Oh, thanks, Brian. Good to actually meet you officially. No. <laughs> have we never, I mean, have we never actually seen each other? I still don't know what it's like, I guess. I